Is the Earth flat? There's a small group of people who think so. I personally don't, but today we're going to find out if it is or not using math and science. One of the main differences of what we would see on a flat Earth versus a globe Earth is shadows. On a globe Earth, you would see an almost straight line formed by shadows going west to east. Now before we can figure out shadows on a flat Earth, it's important to understand what flat Earthers believe. In the flat Earth model, the sun is local and rotates above the plane. So let's use that on an azimuth equidistant projection is zero degrees latitude. As you can see by this demonstration, the shape the shadow makes is highly dependent on your latitude. For this experiment, I'm only going to concern myself with 37 degrees north latitude because that's where I live. As you can see, if this model were true, I would expect a shadow path that peaks in height to the north and drifts off to the south. So now that we have two different predictions with two different models, we can see which prediction actually matches reality, or if either of them even do. To do this, we need a surface to take measurements on, an object perpendicular to the surface, a compass, a measuring device, and ideally something to mark the surface with. I used a piece of cardboard, a potato masher, a compass, ruler, and a marker. After a day of taking measurements every hour, starting at 11 a.m. until 6 p.m., I came up with this, an almost perfectly straight line from west to east. Already, without further analysis, the Flat Earth model has failed at predicting the path shadows take. We could stop here, but let's keep going. Now we'll take a look at the distance of each shadow from its source, and see how we can derive a prediction of what we should see on a globe model. To simplify the math, we're going to solve for a surface tangent to the Earth. That way we can end up with a result that works at any proportion. Let's start with labeling stuff. We can call the circle that represents the Earth R0, and the elevation of the stick H. We can also represent the path of the top of the stick with a circle of radius R1, which is equal to R0 plus H. First, let's create a line tangent to R0. We can create a line representing the stick with y equals tan theta plus 90x. We can then rotate that 90 degrees by turning it into y equals negative tan theta plus 90 to the negative 1x. It's important to realize that in this instance, tan x to the negative 1 is not equal to arc tan x, but rather tan x to the negative 1 equals 1 over tan x. We can then shift this line to point P0, which can be represented as r0 cosine theta plus 90, r0 sine theta plus 90. Substituting for p0, we get y minus r0 cosine theta plus 90 equals negative tan theta plus 90 to the negative 1 times x minus r0 cosine theta plus 90. And solving for y, y equals negative tan theta plus 90 to the negative 1 times x minus r0 cosine theta plus 90 plus r0 sine theta plus 90. Great so far, now we need to find the coordinates of P1, because as you'll notice, it shares the same x position as P2. P1 is just the same as P0, but using R1 instead of R0. So P1 equals R1 cosine theta plus 90, R1 sine theta plus 90. Because we know that P2 shares the x position of P1, and that P2 lies on our tangent line, we can represent our tangent line as T of x, and define P2 as P1x, T of P1x. Solving for P1x gives us P2 equals R1 cosine theta plus 90, T of R1 cosine theta plus 90. Expanding T of x, P2 equals R1 cosine theta plus 90, negative tan theta plus 90 to the negative 1 times R1 cosine theta plus 90, minus R0 cosine theta plus 90, plus R0 sine theta plus 90. To then find the distance of the shadow, d, we need to find the distance between P0 and P2 d equals square root p0x minus p2x squared, plus p0y minus p2y squared. Substituting for p0 and p2 gives us square root r0 cosine theta plus 90 minus r1 cosine theta plus 90 squared, plus r0 sine theta plus 90 minus negative tan theta plus 90 to the negative 1, times r1 cosine theta plus 90 minus r0 cosine theta plus 90, plus r0 sine theta plus 90 squared, which thankfully all simplifies down to d equals h, square root tan squared theta, or even better, h absolute value of tan theta. Now this is great, but only solves our problem two-dimensionally, and doesn't take into account our latitude of 37 degrees. To do this, we can represent our two-dimensional shadow length as a function of h and theta, fs h theta. Next, we can represent our shadow as a two-dimensional vector, vector s. 
with s0 equal to fs of h and theta. To add our latitude into this, we can set s1 equal to fs, h, and l, with l being our latitude. We can then take the magnitude of vector s and get square root fs, h, theta squared plus fs, h, l squared. This is almost there, but not quite, because it doesn't take into account the axial tilt of the Earth's effect on L. In this case, the experiment was performed on April 14th, so 24 days after the March equinox. Because we're now headed for the June solstice, the northern hemisphere will be tilted closer to the sun by the axial tilt of the Earth, A. Meaning, at the June solstice we would subtract A from L. However, we are not at the June solstice yet, so we can just take the sign of our progress towards it which is 90 times 4 times 24 over 365, giving us fa of d equals sine 90 times 4 times d over 365 times 23.4, for d representing the days since March equinox. Finally, subtracting from l, we get square root fsh theta squared plus fsh minus l fad squared, for h equals stick height, theta equals rotation long axis, l equals latitude, and d equals days since March equinox. We can write this as fg h theta ld. For this experiment, h equals 10 11 sixteenths, l equals 37, and d equals 24, giving us fg of 10 11 sixteenths, theta, 37, and 24. Now that we know what to expect on the globe model, we can derive what distance shadows would be on the flat earth model. Unlike the globe model, the flat earth model is much easier to derive shadows on mathematically. However, as you'll soon see, it's not because the model works better, but rather because everything is so vaguely and broadly defined it's hard to pin down an accurate prediction. So, to compensate for this, I'll be nice. I'll give the model the full benefit of the doubt and assume the numbers that predict the most accurate result the model can possibly yield. We can represent the radius of the azimuth equidistant projection at latitude 90 degrees south as r0, meaning the sun would circle the earth at a radius of r0 over 2. Because this projection is equidistant, latitude is made easier to calculate, so we can represent our position as a point P0 at negative R0 over 2 minus R0L over 180, 0, where L represents latitude and the sun is at point P1 on circle R0 over 2, or R0 over 2 cosine theta plus 90, R0 over 2 sine theta plus 90, for theta is within the interval of 0 and 180. Because the flat earth model is, well, flat, we can say that where ds represents shadow distance and d represents the distance between p0 and p1, ds is proportional to d, which we can demonstrate geometrically. However, because the flat earth model doesn't give a figure for the height of the sun above the earth, we can just say ds equals dc, where c is some constant, giving us ds equals c square root p0x minus p1x squared plus p0y minus p1y squared which we can substitute to get ds equals c square root negative r0 over 2 minus r0 l over 180 minus r0 over 2 cosine theta plus 90 squared plus negative r0 over 2 sine theta plus 90 squared and slightly simplify to c square root r0 l over 180 minus r0 over 2 sine theta plus r0 over 2 squared plus r0 over 2 cosine theta squared since we are already multiplying by constant c, we can set r0 to an arbitrary value like 2 to simplify even further, to c square root 2l over 180 minus sine theta plus 1 squared plus cosine theta squared. This looks good, but we're not done quite yet. Most flat earthers explain seasons by saying the orbit of the sun above the earth grows and shrinks in size, causing summer and winter on different sections of the earth. Because there is also, surprisingly, no figures on how much the sun's orbit changes during this time, we can just subtract another constant L0 from L, because we no longer know the exact distance from the orbit of the sun to our latitude relative to R0. Now that we have that out of the way, we end up with c square root 2L minus L0 over 180 minus sine theta plus 1 squared plus cosine theta squared, where theta represents the angle of the sun in orbit, L represents the latitude, C represents a fudge factor, and L0 represents another fudge factor. We can write this as FP of theta L C L0, and in our case, FP of theta 37 C and L0. Now that we have predictions of shadow lengths in both models, let's take actual measurements of what shadow lengths were observed. 
I'll represent the shadows that were observed as a list DS and their times as a list of T. Let's first start by plotting the data points DS over T. Now that we have an idea of the type of curve we would expect, we can start by graphing FP as DS approximates FP of T, 37C, and L0. It's extremely important to notice in the graph of FP, the computer's given full control of C and L0 to maximize the R-squared value of this regression, meaning that this is the absolute best possible scenario you could ever hope to come up with on a flat Earth, and any other fudging would only make the graph more inaccurate. That being said, this is the graph of FG, as DS approximates FG of 10 and 11 sixteenths, T, 37, and 24. Because the globe model is not vague and ambiguous, the computer does not have any control over constants that would allow for fudging the results. This is the raw graph of exactly what is predicted by the globe model without any prior knowledge of DS. Yet, even with the flat earth model being able to cheat, the globe model still completely blows it out of the water and predicts accurately to the fractions of an inch what the shadows would be at certain times. This is easy to see when comparing the R-squared of both graphs, as the globe model has an R-squared over 7 times closer to 1 than the flat earth model. Now that we've compared FG and FP, let's take a look at the fundamental differences between them and why FG is more accurate at predicting reality. The first difference you'll notice from FG and FP is that FP is continuous and FG is undefined at a regular period. This is because at a certain value of theta, the shadow becomes parallel to the line tangent to Earth so they will never intersect, causing the shadow to have a length of infinity. However, on the flat Earth model, something like this never happens, so you just end up with an awkward arbitrary shadow length that defines day from night instead of clearly defined periods. This also means that there is a maximum shadow length on the flat Earth, and that measuring a shadow over that length would be impossible. And, if the sun is at a fixed height above the Earth, there would be a maximum shadow length before it would suddenly become night, which, at least in my opinion, doesn't make any sense. 